thanks a lot for joining in today for the workshop that we're going to have, which is Offense to Defense. My name is Yash Tolia. I am a pre-sales solutions manager in Video Digital. And today we are going to talk about how we can proactively secure our environments against cyber breaches. Uh, just a few, just a few um, housekeeping things for folks online as well. Uh, we've currently, we've started transcribing and recording this meeting and your cameras and microphones have been turned off for the time being. Um, we will turn them on during the Q&A section at the end that we have as well. But in the meanwhile, if you have any questions, feel free to just put them in the Q&A or in the chat uh, in Teams, and we are constantly monitoring them as well. With those housekeeping things out of the way, let's just do quick introductions. We've got uh, Vijay, who's our head of offensive security, and uh, Brad, who's a global SME uh, in the DFIR team along with us that are going to present what offensive security means. We've got Jonathan from Microsoft, who's a global black belt around cybersecurity, and he's going to cover the Microsoft stack and, and how that comes together with offensive security. And then we've got Alkim as well, who is going to join us remotely to talk about uh, what the uh, digital defense report looks like. What is Microsoft's viewpoint from a threat intelligence landscape? Uh, in the introductions, we've got uh, in the agenda, we're going to cover the PDO approach and the Microsoft approach towards offensive security. Think of that as, as the, the major topics uh, along the way. Now, before we jump into what offensive security is, I wanted to take a few minutes just to explain what video digital is as well. So video digital is the fifth largest audit firm in the world. Let that sink in. We've got more than 95,000 people across, uh, sorry, BDO Global, which is the fifth largest uh, auditing firm in the world. And BDO Digital is a subsidiary of that, providing IT digital services to our clients. So we've got presence in more than 160 countries. We've got 95,000 people in the global team. And out of that, we have close to 7,500 in BDO Digital in the world. Uh, I'll go a little deeper into what the UK market looks like from media digital perspective, but one of our USPs, our unique points, is that we are world-class IT service providers in the big market space specifically. Our, our clients uh, are big market customers, and we provide them with IT services across the entire tech stack within Microsoft's space for our mid market clients. So... When we talk about specifically the UK market, we've got 150 people in the UK within BDO Digital, which makes us big, a big partner for Microsoft, even in the UK standards and UK terms. Uh, and certain things that I wanted to highlight is in the middle that you see, we have all the solution partner designations that Microsoft provides, which means we've been recognized for all the Microsoft solution areas as an expert partner. You can see that we also have a lot of specializations, which from Microsoft's perspective means we not only work in that solution area, but we specialize in certain areas within uh, those tech stacks as well. So threat protection, cloud security, information protection, and so on. We've got specific specializations, specific expertise around those areas, those niche topics, within cybersecurity, for example. And that makes us a part of a lot of programs within Microsoft as well. So we are a part of all the programs when it comes to our relationship and alliance with Microsoft. So as you can see, we've got uh, all of those things. One thing I wanted to highlight is on the left side that you see, we were security partner of the year for Microsoft for 2023 globally, which is quite important, which means that Microsoft recognized us as the best partner providing cybersecurity services on the Microsoft stack across the board. So with that in mind, I wanted to hand over to Vijay and Brad to talk us through what our global capabilities are and what offensive security is. So over to you, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good to have you on board. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, the slide that you are seeing is 
just telling you that video exists globally. But when I when we started this team in 2018, our mindset was always focused on one team globally. And we firmly believe hackers don't sit right next to you to do any kind of malicious activity. So the broader the mindset, the better the capabilities are. So you bring different perceptions, different tactics, so that we can leverage as one mindset to deliver the best value to the customer. And we, all the team members in the team is OACP certified, and the techniques, tactics that we use is absolutely bespoke to them. We, we are trying to eradicate the generic penetration testing to give more bespoke tailored uh, services to our customers. At the moment, we have dedicated teams across the globe, and that mainly UK as our center of excellence globally. And we have Singapore for Asia. And then we have uh, South Africa and Norway as our you know, touch points with dedicated teams across the globe. Uh, one of the things that makes fascinating about offensive security is there is no limitation on the learning and also the journey that we can cater as bespoke as possible. That being said, I'm going to just talk about the cyber threat landscape. Before we talk about the landscape, I want to just share the journey in the last two decades that what I have seen with respect to our customer journey and types of customers mindset that I've noticed throughout these two decades. One of them is uh, constantly in the denial mode that it won't happen to me. And why will somebody hack me? That type of questions they have in the denial mode. It's like a, a Titanic thinking it's unsinkable. And suddenly the captain of the ship ignores the iceberg alert. And then the ship sinks. That's kind of a denial mode on it. And I've seen the other extreme part of it where they always worry about security and forget what the purpose they came to the industry to do. Uh, it's like, you know, you because you had one breach and you started putting all the dead bolts to your front door, forgot you opened a bigger window on the other side because you're panicking. And that's one of the things that I've seen. And this uh, third one is kind of a false confidence. It's like the same Titanic shape now is advanced with radio and also light boats onboarded. But when they hit something bad, nobody knew how to use the light bulb and nobody knew how to use the radio because they're not trained. And that actually gave them a false confidence. Having a black boat and the radio is going to help them recover or avoid a disaster. So another one which I always notice is learning by hard lessons. So probably in, in our lifetime, I've seen people changing their password once, assuming there was a breach and they changed the password. But again, it happens next day. The main thing that they need to learn in the hard lessons is like it's not a one time fix. It's always a continuous firefight. And um, some lessons we could take Uber, for example, they've had reach. And then they again come in the news. So that's the hard lesson. Equifax, again, small incident to a bigger incident. And uh, the way how it always travels together is uh, when we have a true leadership in it. And that's the journey that I've seen. If you have true leadership, it's like a friendly neighborhood. You constantly improve yourself, and check everything that you suspect, and then move on. And I think uh, from a security point of view, that would lead us to have a very balanced security in the future if it goes the way it's supposed to be. That being said, I will jump to some statistic, which is not... Microsoft specific uh, report, but we will have our partners explain what they see in their uh, in their uh, technology stack what they find. But I'm going to talk very generic ones what we see as a professional services firm. And uh, we have 34 new players according to one of the EDR company. And uh, 32 new player means 32 different ways and techniques that every one adversary have their own unique way of attacking you know so now you have 34 new players to play now think about how many security product of yours have developed the 34 new ways of protecting it that's something yeah and then new adversaries have been 
growing year on year continuously. Yeah. So we're now in the hundreds, whereas 15 years ago we were in the tens. Yeah. And it's a 11 percent increase if you look at the previous years from 2023. And uh, cloud is no longer a safe, safe bet. It's already, already the attackers are really cloud conscious. So it's like the battlefield is there. And we saw a, a quadruple, that's what Brad like to use, a quadruple <laughs> increase in the number of data breaches when he can walk you through, when he does his war stories, you could see how much data is too much data. That is something which can be answered. And uh, it's not just focused on business data alone. We could see that increase is on also your personal data, which we could uh, see as a extortion. Maybe a real good case study is there, which step one, you had one that you are extorted for, and then somebody sold your access to somebody else and they are doing another extortion and somebody is deploying ransomware, another extortion. Maybe uh, Brad will walk you through that. And cloud is, like I said, it is the most thing that is happening as on today. Uh, with all this AI, ML, data in use, data in rest, everything, cloud is on the center of attraction. Yeah. And just to add on the extortion front, we're now seeing it go from double extortion to triple extortion or triple extortion, where they're stealing data, they're ransomwareing you, they're, they're then causing a denial of service against you or using your data against um, further cases to perform fraud against your company. So it's it's migrated from just a, a simple attack to then actually actively using that data to harm your company and take you down. Yeah. Anything you touch with data is a reputation that's on the stand at the beginning. And one of the things uh, which we saw in the IBM report the last year is if I had to put a price tag for the cybersecurity, it is 4.45 million as per IBM quote. Uh, that means 51% of their operational efficiency will increase. That means if you spend 100 pounds and then you got an incident, you're spending 151 now. And that's what the operational efficiency means there. And if you look at the average cost that it will, you need to invest, if you are a SME, SMC, probably 1.76 million will be saving to you if you don't have an incident on an average basis. And uh, on February 5th, we had 29 billion records, but I think Brad alone has 34 billion records of data uh, in video cloud cracks. But uh, on the other side, what you see is like a mountain that you don't want to climb. It's like 2023 said, uh, it looks like a really steep there, but I see 2024 calling and telling, hold my beer now. It's like, it's like 2024 is also going to show you like uh, I'm going upwards, friend. With that being said, I will pass on to our friend Alkim to talk about uh, Microsoft Digital Defense Report in 2023. What do you, Alkim? Great. Thank you for that overview. Hi, everyone. I'm Alkim and I'm one of our go to market leaders at Microsoft. I will run you through some of our findings from our Microsoft Digital Defense Report, and we've touched on some of the uh, trends from the BDO side too. So across our Digital Defense Report this year, we've really focused on doubling down on how the threat landscape is evolving. And you can see here that, you know, across um, our unique vantage points, we are at a really good time with Microsoft in terms of being able to analyze 65 trillion signals daily, and that is over 750 million signals per second. So we have those capabilities in terms of synthesizing our AI and analytics systems to understand what's happening within the threat landscape, both from a local and global perspective. And also, we have been able to remove uh, 100,000 domains across this, and we've leveraged um, our solutions and our partner ecosystem, uh, which includes BDO, to be able to do this within the specialties. And you can also see here that 
This has been across managed devices, which poses a very important part of managing the threat landscape. And you can see that we have over 10,000 security and threat intelligence experts. So we have those capabilities in terms of researchers, data scientists, cybersecurity experts that pull uh, these reports together yearly. So it's a uh, quite important research that we share with our market and customers too. And one fun fact uh, before we get into some of the trends is in the time that it takes you to read the sentence, we would have defended against 7,320 individual password attacks. So by the time you read that sentence, uh, that attempt would have been made from a multi-factor authentication perspective, which really highlights, you know, just how evolving the threat landscape is and why it's so more important than ever that we place the right systems in place for our customers and partners. And when we look at it from a global perspective, you know, cyber criminals, of course, have stayed very much focused on exploiting, you know, weaknesses in technology and staying ahead of security measures. And they coordinate to create these global networks that uh, deploy these services. And according to some of our research, you can see here 80 to 90 percent of all successful ransomware compromises actually originated through unmanaged devices. And you can see from our end as well, that's why we place such a focus, you know, on DEX and our managed services. And 70% of organizations actually encountering these types of um, qualified attacks have had fewer than 500 employees. So it certainly isn't just uh, for our enterprise customers, and it very much affects our uh, corporates and small to medium businesses, which really forms, you know, 90% of the global UK economy anyway. So it really doesn't differentiate regardless of the size of your organization. And human operated attacks in particular across ransomware made up over 200%. Uh, so there's always usually, you know, a team behind it. And the primary victims, again, uh, were very much small to medium sized organizations, which is why we place such a focus um, from our perspective in terms of extending, you know, security co-pilot in terms of extending some of our, you know, Defender for Business and suite endpoint solutions. And you can also, you know, finally see that with the threat actors, we've really seen a change and we've really seen that exploitation from cloud computing resources such as virtual virtual machines to more on the network security side. So very important that uh, we're aware of these developments. And, you know, in addition to that, we're also seeing a novelty and an increase in these notifications. So you can kind of see um, the majority of the type of attacks were across identity. So 42% were successful identity attacks. The remainder were a mixture between ransomware, phishing, and business email compromise, also known as BEC. So we're observing these novel tactics, techniques, and procedures, or you know, attack progression, and we're seeing our customers, um, you know, really experience these things, which is why it's so important to bring them up to speed on Defender for Endpoint, our you know, E5 solutions, what we're doing from a cloud security perspective, and of course, you know, the extended detection and response we provide with um, both from a Defender Suite perspective, but also our security co-pilot integration. And from a trend perspective, um, you know, actors don't really differentiate by industry, but you can kind of see that majority of these attacks have been across higher education and discrete manufacturing. So these have been the most, uh, you know, vulnerable to these attacks, but cyber criminals have broadly attacked all sectors that you can see here, whether you are in professional services, retail, capital markets, they really don't differentiate. And it's really important that uh, we place that focus when we're thinking about cyber defense <coughs> and how to build that operationally. And in addition to that, you know, of course, when we talk about ransomware, there's also a very important component in terms of phishing. And I, th I think phishing has, you know, uh, kind of this approach in terms of being seeing old school, but actually very much the techniques for this are evolving too. And you can see that, you know, from 2021 to where we are today, we're seeing a significant surge and increase. And unlike traditional phishing attacks, they're evolving and they are uh, getting to a point where they're actually using user account credentials and they are adding additional domains to be able to be successful in their phishing attempts. 
So how do we combat this? Um, as an organization, there are certain things you can do, and we'll get to some of them in a second, but really it focuses around increasing the resilience and cyber defense of your organization. So what does that mean? It means first, any cloud is the best defense, whether that's our Microsoft Cloud infrastructure solutions, which you know seem very um, easily to our security uh, centers and to our workload solutions. It's really important to prioritize that cloud infrastructure. Secondly, as Microsoft, both internally and externally, of course, we operate on a zero trust model. And what that means is that we have that uh, capability and thinking when we place resilience against ransomware and against intrusions we're seeing for ourselves as an organization too. And third, what I mentioned earlier around unmanaged devices, we have again observed that 80 to 90% of all attacks originate from unmanaged devices. So making this a priority in your organization will make a very significant impact quickly. And finally, we are always looking to modernize our approach and with AI, Copilot, and the various uh, machine learning language models that we're seeing being implemented into cyber operations and defense, we know that this has to be a part of the cyber resilience frameworks. And that's why we are continuing to you know, evolve and build on our responsible AI act, uh, which integrates into what we're doing in security too. So I want to quickly touch on uh, from a nation state perspective. So we covered uh, more on the local and organizational side of things, but from a nation state perspective, what we're seeing is, you know, we're seeing an increased investment in use of cyber operations as a tool to achieve these um, ransomware phishing and other various types of attacks that we just went through. And we're also seeing a rise in the frequency. So they are focusing more on building, you know, that operational capability to be successful uh, in their attacks, essentially. And you can see here that, um, you know, this has been very prominent from a geological perspective as well, and it really does not differentiate. And when we look across, you know, whether that's Russia, North Korea, all of these developments are very much, um, very much relevant across globally. And although we're seeing new trends uh, this year, such as pivoting away from high volume destructive attacks to you know more pointed uh, cyber cyber attacks we're still seeing uh, some of the traditional methods being used with a more sophisticated uh, intelligence approach uh, by some of these threat actors and you can see that from both a nation state and state affiliated perspective they have pivoted away from those you know large destructive attacks that we had seen in in the few previous years and it's very much pointed around uh, making a wider, you know, negative impact in a more focused aspect. And finally, I think this is a good view from a nation state perspective to understand, you know, how are they growing? Are we seeing the same growth in certain countries globally, in the UK, in the US, etc.? And although it varies a little bit, as you can see here, uh, for example, in Asia Pacific, we're seeing a significant increase in North Africa. In Europe, it's very much top of mind. And you can see that United Kingdom is actually uh, the second most vulnerable uh, and has been to these effects after Ukraine. And this is why we place so much local focus as well from a Microsoft perspective. So if we continue on to the next section, how do we innovate for security and resilience and how do we combat some of those things that we're seeing in the market and the answer to that is of course we have our foundational capabilities but we're also integrating ai so with modern ai advancements that i'm sure you would have seen we are leveraging the signals and the capability of integration to build a safer and more resilient online ecosystem. And we bring our customers and partners on that journey with us. And our approach you know, for this year in particular will of course be an AI first focus, while also embracing some of our core principles such as secure by design, secure by default and secure in deployment. And we have our co-pilot event next week on Monday and Tuesday, and it's going to be a really uh, fundamental momentum in helping our customers understand this. And finally, of course, from a 
uh, machine learning side of things, there's a big potential to transform some of the cyber defense that we have built on foundationally to next gen cybersecurity. And we have our researchers and scientists and our teams working on it uh, at the moment from a cyber defense perspective, as well as our uh, DART and uh, incident response teams. So one final thing I will mention before I wrap up, from an AI perspective, it really is going to be the key thing that you add to your tool stack for defensive threat intelligence, because it provides you with more data and the more data and signals and intelligence you have, the better the solution will be from a foundational perspective, but also in helping you understand and combat some of those aspects of uh, the signals and the notifications, et cetera. And of course, you'll have a better infrastructure, uh, which we discussed as being fundamental in building that cyber resilience. And we're continuing to innovate with our responsible AI practices, which form the crucial of our trust and privacy that we place in our customers. So I will leave that there. And I have attached our full digital defense report. So if you would like to learn more in terms of what we're doing from a foundational security perspective or how we're incorporating or recommend that you incorporate AI in your cyber defense tool stack, then please feel free to leverage the link here. And I will hand over to the next section. So I thought it was it is more easy to explain offensive security when you talk about zero trust. So hence I added zero trust and offensive security, how you bridge the trust gap. Basically, we are in that industry to bridging the trust gap by breaking it. So it's the offense is the one of the best way of testing your defense to make it more stronger. So zero trust basically covers these six elements. One is your identity. Pretty much that means who you are, what you have, how you validate yourself. Uh, the identity is basically like a trusted handshake. And the offensive security is picking that handshake and then getting through it. And that's, that's the type of test that we do. And uh, if you look at zero trust as a concept, it's basically a mindset of never trust anything, verify everything. That's the concept. But in your right side, Jeff, image that you see, it's actually doing the zero trust model, but it is following the zero trust of checking as a process. But is it actually doing the job? Is the is the individual doing the full trust job? And that's what offensive security will be doing in in the place of zero trust, right? On the devices, devices are like like Alki mentioned about unmanaged device in her report. That is the main causes for everything. Assume you have a device. You connect it to your network. How did you validate that the device is supposed to do only the job it is supposed to do? And that's what we do in the face of assume breach scenario as part of our testing, that we do an offensive security testing by attaching two devices, one trusted device, one untrusted device. How we can interchangeably uh, gain keys to the castle? That's, that's uh, on the device security. And applications, normally I explain this to uh, uh, Xcos, like uh, applications are like the chocolate box, right? You, you have good chocolate, but you are actually checking whether it contains nuts or not as part of your zero trust. Yeah, take mark that, awesome. But we have that specific testing team who have an appetite to spit out the chocolate test. Plan. That's what okay. offensive security does. And the infrastructure is more like the full fortress uh, specific to uh, how you are interconnected on your infrastructure, but whether it's cloud or non-cloud, normally for hackers, it doesn't make a difference. They are already cloud conscious. And even if the infrastructure has every stage gate verified, gatekeeper, uh, the offensive security is basically whatever your stage gate that you're having the gatekeeper, there's always a ladder that we can jump on top of it or, or have a parachute or have a drone to jump on it and then escape the infrastructure action. That's the type of testing that we do. On the networking, uh, I explain, it's like a spider web. The zero trust tells you all the threats in the web needs to be stronger, secure. 
and our offensive security is more like a wind that blows off the one which is light threaded within that uh, spider silk that you see. That's the part of the testing. And data in in motion very simply explained it's that is your ground jewel. And your ground jewel is absolutely safe when you put it into your silk. And that is your data to rest. In. And it is it is armed protected when it goes in transit to one user to another. Great protection. And in use when it's on a display. So what offensive security do is a fake heist of stealing that ground jewel. That's exactly what an offensive security is. And this, all these things, we do it in the form of red team, blue team, whatever the color you want to call, basically to test every defense, making sure that it is enforced correctly. And then it is doing its intended job and not breaking down. And <laughs> with that being said, I will pass on to Brad to talk about some of the war stories that we have done in video in this last six years. Some interesting things which you would have never thought that the incident could have been like that, right? What do you read? Cool. Thank you, Ben. Um, Thanks, so sir. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to quickly um, just give some background on a red team engagement that we recently um, performed against one of our clients. Our client has migrated to um, Azure. They have um, they're fully deployed in Intro ID. They are moving away from an on site Active Directory. However, there are still some remnants of it. The client gave us one flag. The flag was to obtain global admin um, level privileges in their Intro ID. As a global admin, you can essentially perform any activity within the usual um, Active Directory. So when we look at performing a red team, we have to split it into some phases. We first perform some open source intelligence. We identify where and how we can break it. We then can look at actively trying to break in. And once we get there, we then have to look at recon or reconnaissance. How can we find where we're going to pinpoint inside the, um, the network to laterally move or to privilege escalate ourselves? So I'll start by talking through some open source intelligence or OSIP as we call it. We can look at domains and subdomain enumeration. Um, traditionally, this is done mainly based on DNS and SSL certifications. Some username enumeration. We can look on social media, LinkedIn, um, or previous breaches. Or we can look at some subdomain enumeration based on the, uh, the data that we've already got. So here we can see that one of our clients has published um, their password policy online. That's probably going to come in pretty handy later. Now we can look at social media and see that Microsoft have done a nice little tour video. Maybe our client has done that too. And finally, we can look at floor plans. Now, these don't really come in too handy here because we're breaking into cloud. But a red team, there is no restraint. So we can break in physically to any building that we want. That the client is. <laughs> so, Internally, we can use a tool that we built called Video Blowfish. Video Blowfish automates open source intelligence. And for clients, it can be used to identify where that weak point is. So we can look at the DNF, DNS and SSL registrations. We can look at social media. Here we've got an um, extraction of the credentials that we found on a company. I won't say who, um, but you can see that uh, one of the ex prime ministers had a really secure password of his own name. Um, and then finally, we can look at phishing registrations. How can we use these um, these subdomains or domains to try and typo squat and attack the client? Um, based on uh, Alkim's data, you can you know that phishing is a is a real problem. We can look at open ports and 
The best thing about open source intelligence is you're never going to identify that we've scammed you. This is all information that's based on the internet already. We can also look at vulnerabilities. These web scanners are running constantly and you can buy this data very cheap. So now we've done our OSINT, we can look at the initial entry to the client. Um, as VJ said earlier, I may or may not have quite a large database of credentials from previous breaches. Um, these are openly and freely available on the internet. We've got about 35 billion now. Um, this is about a week old, so we've increased it a couple of hundred million in the time. So based on that, we're going to now start looking at attacking the client. We've got a whole list of usernames and passwords that have been previously breached. And we can start looking at credential stuffing. Credential stuffing is simply where we use the breached um, username and password and we spray it against you. Bingo, we get one hit. Fortunately, or unfortunately, the account has MFA on. The good thing for us, they haven't, um, they haven't enforced it properly. So we can still access uh, the MS graph, which means that we can still extract information from the tenant, but only via the command line. Now that we're actively on the tenant, we can run a tool that we call, or that is called a Azure Hand. Um, this is renowned in the industry, and there's other tools that are can run against um, Google Cloud, GCP, or AWS. Azure Hound will extract all of the relationships within the Azure data. And using this tool, we can then start looking for one other type of account. Why? Because the other type of account that we're going to look for probably won't have MFA enforced. These are service accounts. So based on the information that we found during our OSIN, we know that they're using a pretty poor password policy. So we can start password guessing these service accounts. And bingo, we get quite a few hits. Now, simply signing in online is easy. We sign in, we register our own device for MFA, and we've got MFA bypass. If you look closely, you can also see that we've compromised one of the admin accounts, SA admin. Um, this in particular was usually a really poor password. But hey, -ho, we're here now. So we can start our cloud enumeration. Where are we going to go? And how are we going to get to our end goal of global admin? So using the data that we've got off Azure and the data that we have from the compromised accounts, we can simply start looking at what route we can take to break through. So we know that we've got an SA admin account, which fortunately for us is a domain admin. Unfortunately, based on the fact that it's a domain admin, it does have MFA set against it, so we can't actually use it to sign in. Again, fortunately, client has a um, RDP enabled session. Uh, it's through AWS, but still we can sign on to their domain. Great, we can now use a service account to sign in and elevate our privileges using that session. Secondly, we can look at another um, Azure Sync account. This Azure Sync account owns an application called Quest On Demand. Now, Quest On Demand is Quest On Demand is a company who run um, SaaS applications to manage IT. And this company has followed the standard deployment of Quest On Demand application in their tenant. However, if we look at the Quest On Demand app, we can also see that it has the directory read write all privileges, which essentially allows us to add ourselves to global admin. So let's start looking at attacking. Using the account we can or using the rdp session we can sign on to the synchronization service manager from there we can remotely stop service synchronization dump the ad sync database and then dump the um the secrets that are stored on that synchronization service machine essentially 
allowing us to print out in plain text the AZ sync account password. So now we've simply, very, very simply, dumped the, um, the account that we need to add ourselves onto Global Anglin. So let's walk through the compromise. First here, we can see us um, logging in. The next one, as the uh, synchronization account. The next one, we are adding a new password onto the, um, onto the Quest On Demand application. Once we have that, we can dump the uh, access token. And then finally use that access token to add ourselves to a global admin, which is our final flag. Now, this may seem pretty trivial, um, but we see this, this complex uh, attack um, optimizing and abusing uh, applications through Azure quite often now. So really, we can't be just assuming that our zero trust deployment is secure because we've deployed it. Um, did you want to add anything about the perfect data? Yeah, so we had the, one of our clients manufacturing company losing our last 10 tenders with 10, 15% mark. So they were worried like, is that the individual who is responsible for putting a code is actually leaking the information or is it something going on in the network? We were employed by the client to see if there is any anomaly going on. So what we found was an interesting application sitting on their cloud environment that actually syncs every single mailbox to uh, a person in a sanctioned country or unsanctioned country <laughs> to give them access to the quotations that my client was actually proposing for their customers on manufacturing, let's say, simple uh, equipment for a aircraft, like a millions of things. And I wouldn't say which country, but Chinese, <laughs> they would actually outside 10, 15% more. And this became in light in recent with Palo Alto and other uh, vendors started looking at it. It's called Perfect Data as an application sits on the cloud that syncs mailboxes just to monitor specifically manufacturing, like that actually matches with Alkim's report as well. The discrete manufacturing is still on the top. And that's how they were able to outsmart the US guys or UK guys in outbidding and winning that manufacturing stuff. So the credential stuffing that Brad talked about initially, I think again, it doesn't have to be only the link's credential, can be just I still remember and have a call recording that our team called as part of social engineering and convinced the person to type HTTP slash slash fake website dot com and then enter the username and password through a phone. So you could do it through social engineering, email phishing, and there are multiple other ways that you could, I could come from a trusted supply chain because you don't own them, you don't own their security, and it could come from multiple different ways. The ultimate goal is, do you have the detection capability to put a full stop as soon as the account was compromised? Do you have the capability? Because if you can't detect, you cannot prevent it, right? And then do you have a capability to do a regular health check of yourself to answer, am I in trouble? What can I do about it? And uh, one more example is the another application that was sitting and just sending them only information relating to new users that are getting at it. So there's plenty of interesting cases, but the next one you're going to talk about is very, very unique for us in my two decades. That was something yeah. very surprising. Yeah, absolutely. And just to, just to add before I move on to my instant response and uh, other examples of the IR, every single vector of this attack could have been solved by a Sentinel and a vendor differential. If we just avoid it against um, Sentinel against uh, cloud activity, Azure Hunt and such. We would have identified that account being breached originally. We would have identified the new MFA registration and everything would have been halted from the get-go. We wouldn't have been able to um, yeah. 
guess the uh, or credential stuff at the beginning, let alone guess the mask value. Yeah. So Azure Hound, it was called Black Hound before, and then it was called Sharp Hound for yeah. points. So the hounds are already there. Yeah. So it's just a matter of uh, detecting how the hounds are making noise. Here. And I think that is covered in the E5 kind of full yeah, fledged yeah. portfolios. Um, so what's the damage? Why why is it a problem for someone getting access, global admin access to your cloud, whether it be AWS, GCP, um, or Azure? I'll run you through the first example um, of a session hijacking attack. Now, this was very, very unique for us because um, it just shows that the cloud is vulnerable to a wide variety of attacks. This isn't just a, a simple attack where someone's trying to steal your data. Yeah. This is people optimizing what you're exposing and abusing it. So we first start with a phishing email. Um, uh, let's call him Terry. Terry receives this phishing email for a, um, a new invoice. Terry enters his creds, updates tenant subscription. That tenant subscription is then migrated over to his attacker account. He then creates 4,630 virtual machines. Um, to do what? Anyone guess? There's some code snippets. The top one is, um, these, are, these are variables of randomizing comments they're having on YouTube videos. So each VM was watching thousands of YouTube videos a day. These YouTube videos were generating revenue. They were being sold for um, $100 a day. We'll pay you $100. Someone hacks you, you set up the videos to be watched, and then you make a thousand pounds from it. Simple market, easy markup. Like similar, similar to the Cambridge Analytica, if you want your profile to be released, we will make it happen. That's one of the grounds. It was very interesting for us to see a single Python script can install five different browsers and have multiple profiles inside for every single profile to view a specific video game. Video game files, YouTube. The next one I'm going to talk through is a trip distortion. Um, this is based on AWS, which was a client that we responded to earlier this year. Um, Jenkins is a AWS deployment, um, deploys code across the cloud infrastructure. Um, they simply exploited Jenkins with a new exploit, um, remote code execution on that server. Because Jenkins is deploying code across the environment, it's very simple to give it a really privileged account. Doesn't need to be, but the majority of people are giving it the account for AWS, which essentially is the global admin account. So they've given it global admin. We then um, we then see them moving into EC2. We see them also moving into their databases. They extract all of the data. Extortion number one. They access EC2, create a lambda, and deploy crypto miners across the entire estate. So, extortion number two. After the client response, they go, oh crap, I've got um, 20 grand sitting on my account now. I only had five pounds yesterday. How has this happened? Oh, we look, um, 10, of our, 10 of our VMs are now being highly utilized for crypto mining. Traditionally, Monero. But, so, what does the client do? Deletes the Monero miner. Um, good, as you would. But the attacker sees that and they then execute ransomware across the entire state. Extortion number three. These attacks are being seen more and more commonly where individuals are responding to incidents and seeing another attack on their environment. You know, you've got ransomware providers who are, um, or services of ransomware as a service providers who are then seeing clients not paying, denial of servicing them. Um, and you know, they're causing real interruption because it's what they do and it's how they do it. Yeah. What they do best though. Yeah. I think we were contacted after the ransomware was executed, then only we identified these two were already in place. Uh, yeah. 
data exfiltrate is gone is gone because if it is personal data in this case it was an higher education which still matches with Alkim's finding it was an higher education uh, college that has students data you can nullify some of the information but not their first name last name date of birth and their uh, any other unique identification which technically now they have abide by law to going back to every student tell them that, that they had this breach and then take the overhead on responding to everything and also they went back to book and pen to take the admissions and etc so it was completely crippled down during this incident yeah it was a yeah very interesting to bring their business back up luckily they had uh, three different cloud providers so you had one in the aws you have sap and you have the oracle so we were able to pull off some of the backups from different cloud provider and then bring their business back up with the applications that they were running yeah it was a very interesting thing i still remember the guy let's call him raw he calls me and says you know what it's like i used to pay an electricity bill of 100 pounds now i had to pay like fifty thousand overnight and it's like they're running a full hollywood in one house <laughs> <laughs> to pay that bill, like running an entire energy company in one house, that kind of bill. And then it was it was a really interesting, uh, interesting engagement. But however, this could have been stopped. Again, detection is the primary key here. And if, if you look at the total cost, you know, you've got the 50 grand that you've spent yeah. on um, cloud computing overnight. But then you've also got the business interruption the business teams that you're having to pull together, the um, the cost of the incident response, the cost of the recovery, the cost of identifying what data has been stolen, the cost of trying to pro um, proactively stop that data from being spread around the internet. And it's, it's gradually and uh, continuously growing, um, and it can easily be stopped by just either one, performing ongoing and um, continuous pen testing, and two, um, setting up your cloud infrastructure with full monitoring services. I think I'm passing over to Jonathan now to do yep. uh, the SIEM and XDR section. John? Cool. Just forward there. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. So, after all those horrendous war stories, <laughs> <laughs> I've got the pleasure of going through and telling you how Microsoft can actually help get sort of by some of the signals it is that we need from, uh, from across the board. The first thing is, Microsoft's strategy going forward has been uh, seen plus XDR. But future perspective is now changed and it's now um, uh, it's now one stock and generative AI. And we're going to go through exactly what that means. But to begin with, we're going to set the scene of exactly how we got to where we are. So as you can see, I'm agreeing with everybody else. The zero trust is sort of like one of the key principles that we need, right? Which is absolute, which is don't trust anything that's going on within your ecosystem and sort of like continuous validation on whether that identity, uh, that user, what it is that they're doing. So let's have a look. One of my favorite questions that I say to customers is, where, what are your critical assets within the organization? And so many times I actually get told they've got no idea. They haven't got them listed. They haven't got them documented. They haven't got them uh, written down. Firstly, look, identities like VJ was saying before, do you actually know who the critical identities are within your organization? That doesn't just have to be the CEO, that could be somebody in finance. And we'll come on to one of the stories a little bit later on. If they've got the right privileges to be able to do things, what is it that they're doing? Devices, endpoints, we've all got them, but who's holding those endpoints? Have you got sort of like store devices, which means you're using those for admin privileges? Have you got those, those set up in that way? Applications, what applications are critical to the business? And really well, so many organizations just do not know what applications are actually critical to the operating of the business. And what infrastructure is that actually sitting on top of? Where is it? We've multi-cloud, on-premise. Have you got data centers that you're winding down? What's going on within them? Networking, and as Vijay said before, data, absolutely key. Do you know where all of the data is? Um, what's sitting on top? And what would be the impact if something happened to that data? We just heard about sort of like the ransomware stories there as well. So it's really difficult to be able to protect all of these things. We're going to have a look at exactly why that is. The attack surface is expanding. Like Vijay says, we've got multi-cloud, we've got on-premise, we've got data centers, 
with zero trust, we're actually moving the boundary and that ends up being wherever the user is, whatever it is that they've got access to. Pesky users have got habits of uploading things into clouds that would not even sort of like uh, have been sanctioned by the business that they're having on to. Do we even have visibility on those applications as well and what's going on within your environment? Uh, rapid acceleration and sophistication of cybercrime. A couple of points here on this one. We're now seeing AI becoming more and more sort of like a driver for attacks and that's just going to increase going on as well. Um, my understanding is, and I've heard various different numbers, if cybercrime was a country, it would have a GDP, I think it's the fifth largest GDP in, in the world. So, about right? yes. so, I mean, so right now, you know, you can see exactly sort of like the value, sort of like, you know, what cybercrime is and the impact that it is that they've got in there. And how do we actually protect that? And yeah, and we had some stats earlier on again, exactly what that, what that impact looks like. So why is it so difficult? Firstly, we've got sort of like you have to protect email. Sort of like, where's the email coming in? We heard earlier on some great stories around sort of like being able to extract all of those emails. What's going on there? Endpoints, we aren't working uh, in the office anymore. It always used to be we were inside the office, we could see what's going on. Now everyone's working from coffee shops, etc. There was that great story, which probably not that good. It was about a German general who was in a Singapore hotel and the Russians were listening in on sort of like you know, listening to the calls that they've got. We're all working in different locations now. Do we have a view of exactly what that security is? Identities, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more a little bit later on, but that's key because the, the more stories that Brad was talking about before, we can understand what those identities are doing within the network and where they're going and what they're trying to do and pivot. We can combine and correlate those individual actions. Quite clear that those individual actions are not particularly good actions, but if you isolate them, they're perfectly natural stages to go through there. Cloud applications, again, you've got uh, sanctioned and non-sanctioned applications. Have you got a visibility of what's going on there? And on-premise workloads as well. So we've got a nice little kill check, which reflects exactly what we're hearing earlier on. And, 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 I'll, and I'll give you a story. This is a story about a friend of mine, a buddy that I play golf with. He works at a mortgage organization. And he was telling me a story that there was a, a girl who works in one of the finance teams. She got an email that's pesky users do, clicked on a link took it to a fake Office 365, uh, Office 365 login page. She didn't actually know that it was a fake Office 365 login page. She said they used the password in it just refreshes back to Office 365. And at that point in time, they've got her credential. What they then did is they logged in and they just created an outbound forwarding. And they just sat there and watched over a period of months on the transaction and the conversation that was going on. And in the end, when it was the case of, oh, we're going to transfer you money, they jumped in and they said, you pay it to this uh, account, the sort code and account number rather than the other one. And the only reason it got blocked is because they had a good relationship with the bank. The bank phoned up and said, Are you sure you want us? We've been using this account for ages. But other than that, they've sort of like been able to get in. So the email comes in, the user clicks on that link. We then sort of like start feeling from the endpoint, understand where they're going out to. Is it malicious? We get leveraging the threat intelligence that Alkin was talking around earlier on from a Microsoft perspective. We're watching all of the threat actors that are out there. We're seeing sort of like an indicator of compromise. We know that URL uh, is a bad URL. We're seeing that that IP address is a bad IP address. We see that that URL is only 24 hours old. That's, uh, and again, that's another risky point there. Being able to understand, do you have that telemetry to be able to understand that? Identities. With Defender for Identity, we can see that if a user account has been compromised, what's that user account now doing? What's it trying to do within the environment? You start seeing sort of like the logs that come from uh, Active Directory, the activities that it is that they're doing. And we can then start seeing sort of like whether that's uh, privileged accounts, we can start seeing whether has a, an account been added into a privileged group? Has their new privileged account been added? Their new permission? What's happened within that? And ultimately then, has the domain been compromised within the environment? Finally, that goes all the way to the end there, we can then start seeing whether they're going into cloud app. Are they taking that? Um, that identity that they've compromised and are they going to various different cloud apps or on-premise ecosystems, VPNs, in order to try and have a look there. So XDR is where we're having a look and we're correlating across all the board here where we get email, endpoint, identity and workloads. Just I had one of the conversations earlier on, this is where we're taking the capabilities within E5 security and we're leveraging those and applying those on top of sort of like the E3 workloads as well within there. So that's sort of like the, the end user XDR piece. So sort of like that's everything that a user touches within there. Again, that's a link where we can see the email, the endpoint identities and the workloads. 
and we've got sort of like with Defender for Office, we've got sort of like safe links. So if the user clicks on a link, we will actually qualify whether that link is safe before it actually goes to the, the, the URL. We're do doing sort of like endpoint detection and response. So we'll actually see what's the endpoint actually doing. And if it is doing something malicious, it's actually possible to be able to isolate it. We're going to talk about this a little bit later on. We've even got automated attack disruption. So what the kill chain we had there, we will actually be able to close off those malicious activities automatically built in within uh, Defender for Endpoint and the other workloads in order to prevent that kill chain uh, having any malicious activity within seconds after our, uh, us seeing it. We have a look at privileged access management, identity and threat detection. We check whether those IDs are verified. Is that identity, for example, coming from a country where it shouldn't be coming from? Uh, and therefore, or is there impossible travel? We validate whether that is. We sort of implement the multi-faction multi-tax tools correctly and properly, because often they are, and I'll tell you what, it's one customer I was with the other day, they had uh, multi-factor authentication fatigue. There was an attack coming in, and the user just keeps on approving, even though they're not logging into anything. It's sort of like, you sort of like, oh, we may as well get rid of multi-factor authentication. But these are the challenges that you've got. How do we sort of like make sure that we're able to be able to prevent that? So let's have a look at sort of like what we've got. So this is the Steam plus XDR piece that we've got. So first of all, let's have a look. Uh, so Microsoft Sentinel, that is the cloud-based C from Microsoft. This is where we take alerts all from sort of like everything that we just saw on the previous slide, Defender for XDR. We also take sort of like third-party alerts. It is dead easy to do this one, even I can do it. You just let like you set up connectivity uh, to the individual sort of like log sources that is you want to. We pass it. We've got sort of like automation rules. We've got analytic rules, which are triggered when we see things that are correct. We know what's bad. One of my favorite examples is with SAP. So again, a user logging in, creating a new payee, and then paying somebody money is a perfectly legitimate business process within the environment. But what if it's not? If somebody's managed to sort of like uh, uh, exploit an, an identity and that they're actually logging in and they're going to pay themselves some money. So what you can do for you get to the edge, you just you create a sort of like an automation rule, which is we've seen these activities. Mr. User, is this what you want to be able to do? Yes or no? Yes, it is. Fine. No problem. No, it's not. We isolate the device, we isolate the identity, all the red flashing lights and all the police come flying out and we sort of like go go and sort of like address them. So it's very easy to be able to create workflows where we align with the business requirements as well as the security because sometimes we don't know security and business we don't know if those two flow together then microsoft 365 defender this is where we secure your users but it's not by the way it's ios mac os linux windows it's all of those all right so we, we protect all of those things within uh for that an end user touches everything that they're they're involved in. that's the the um sort of like the the end user xdr piece we've also got defender for cloud right so that's Azure, and also we know people use AWS and Google as well. So it's it's the idea. <laughs> but there's API connectivity into AWS and Google as well, which means from a few clicks you can start correlating right what's happening with AWS, with uh, Azure, and with Google Cloud, and even with on-premise where you can link onto there to be able to see. You can start running. A security score where you can get on posture management to understand is my posture better in Azure compared to AWS or on premise? Where are my uh, vulnerabilities? What is it that I need to be able to do in order to be able to improve those ecosystems across the board there? And then this is where you can link into your existing security portfolio with all of the, your tools that it is you've got. So it doesn't have to be everything sort of like security on board in some of your next gen firewalls, for example. Although I'll, I'll tell you a story as well. This is another customer. They were saying that they had deployed all of the XDR tools. By the way, I don't recommend this, but I'll, 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 you'll understand why. They deployed all the XDR tools. So they had um, endpoint protection, sort of like uh, on a defender endpoint on their endpoints. They had all of their services in the cloud. They had nothing on premise anymore. Could, almost a dream scenario where you have no sort of like on premise infrastructure. They were saying that they, in the previous six months, because they could see one end and they could see the other end. They were no longer getting valuable alerts coming from their files because they were coming from the endpoint and they were coming from their cloud infrastructure. He didn't have the bottom to turn off, sort of like logging the firewall logs. But when you get to a zero trust ecosystem, you can actually see both ends of the equation and the journey is not uh, going to trigger those analytics. But it's really interesting sort of like mindset 
and where you sort of folk can get to then. So just drilling into these ones. So first of all, see, like I said, there is over 200 data connectors. If you install the content, it installs the connector, the parser for all of those logs. It sets up the analytics rules, the, uh, the automation rules that I was talking about earlier on. Dead easy to be able to do all of that one. From there, you can detect, you can investigate, you gather your threat intelligence feeds and your machine learning uh, and leverage all of that, those capabilities, again, that Alkin was talking around with those 10,000 analysts feeding into there as well. All of this ultimately re reduces your MTTR. We're going to talk about how we're going to do that even better going forward. And again, with sort of like some uh, some of our E5, A5, F5 customers, you can even sort of like uh, reduce your costs on your ingestion there around Sentinel. With Defender for Cloud, again, it's super easy. The APIs for AWS and Google is literally a number of clicks in order to be able to do that. And then just a couple of hours later, you've got the security posture of all of those environments. What is it that you need to do? Recommendations for improvement in order to be able to improve the security posture and understanding what's going on there. Um, you can block sort of like those advanced malware on Linux and Windows servers as well, and you can protect against the malicious attacks. And again, finally, just sort of like going back on this one, uh, this the 365 Defender, that is sort of like anything that an end user would touch. So that goes into the Defender XDR portal. This sort of like links onto the, the next thing. What we're actually doing is that we are now taking everything that you've got within Sentinel, Defender for Cloud, and ingesting that into what we're now calling the Defender XDR portal one song. So we'll be in a position where Sentinel will be looking at all of the data that we're getting from Defender XDR, Defender for Cloud, and those third party ecosystems, which will then reduce that mean time to resolution even more so. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a moment. Fine. Right. So, theme platforms are post breach detection tools, right? which means that we have to have seen something happen in order for us to be able to respond to it. So, let's take any particular sort of like endpoint or service. It takes about one to two minutes for the, that endpoint to send those logs into the, uh, the the management server portal that it might take to be, whether that be Defender for Endpoint or uh, sort of like even sort of like a competitive tool. Or those logs then have to be shipped into your scene. With firewall logs, what tends to happen is, is that uh, every five minutes or so, it will bundle them up rather than streaming them and send them to the scene for them to be able to be correlated against. So that can take five to two minutes between before once that leaves the uh, the endpoint before it arrives into the sink. We then run analytics rules. We normally run those 5, 10, 15 minutes. So again, another five minutes before those uh, alerts then get sort of like triggered. And then we've got saw rules that then respond on that one. And again, they can be five or 10 minutes or so after that. Once that sort of like alert then gets created, so maybe what we've done is we've created a service now ticket, a tier one analyst will pick that up. That might be 10, 15 minutes or so before they start triaging, and they might take it a while before they then hand it into the tier two analyst there. So if we add all of that, it could easily be sort of like 45 minutes or so there before that sort of like particular alert gets investigated. Upon. And we saw earlier on is that breaches can happen within minutes within the environment there. And during that time, the attacker can spread laterally, they can generate new alerts, uh, and then we can have uh, those log aggregators sort of like take a long time. So what can we do? So I mentioned before, automatic attack disruption. So that's built within the Defender 365 capabilities, and in particular on Defender for Endpoint. And what we're able to do here is that when we know that something is malicious, we will isolate the device, we'll isolate the identity, we will isolate the processor automatically within that in, in minutes. So between there, you can see that's between one to two minutes for it to arrive in Defender XDR before there's that response. There's Microsoft Defender experts as well, in a position to be able to look at those ones and to be able to respond on our behalf. And finally, we'll talk about this ever slightly in a minute. So security Copilot, Copilot for Security. This is the latest gen AI capability uh, where there's some announcements tomorrow on this one, which is where you're able to leverage that to investigate incidents and understand the threat intelligence of exactly what's going on within them. If you were to use a non sort of like joined up service, other generative AI solutions, you'd be all the way over here about um, half an hour or so before they picked it up because you still have to go through those varying stages of sort of like the seed process. So, one more slide before, uh, before I wrap up. So, again, we're bringing all of these capabilities together. 
general availability of sort of like one song is going to be September this year. And that is when all of the alerts and all the logs from Sentinel and all the alerts from Defender 365 and Defender for Cloud are all going to be in the same location. So you can run queries, you can run analytics rules, all of the sort of like the notifications, the triggers, the responses, all of that correlation. We go back to that previous slide. All the way over sort of quite closer to number three there, rather than us having to go all the way around to number six, speeding up all of that response within the environment then. Uh, but also one of the key pieces then is sort of like uh, is security code code pilot for security as well. So on the last slide that we've got in there, code pilot for security fits in the middle of all of those security services. Then on the left hand side, there's everything that I covered today, uh, Defender XDR, Defender Sentinel, uh, and sort of like all of the cloud platforms, sort of like uh, with whether that be Google, AWS, or Azure as well, and on premise, key point there. And on the right, we've got more of our compliance capabilities, Entra being sort of like our identity, and Microsoft issue. This is where BDO is sort of like being in a position to what go through each one of those technologies, those capabilities, and make sure that they are deployed in an optimum fashion and they are monitored in the correct way, making sure that you're getting all of the alerts, the visibility that it is that you need. And then leveraging Copilot for security in order to be able to augment their team and what it is that they can do in order to be able to help and respond you to those, those elements as well. And there's some super big announcements tomorrow which are coming around around that, which are going to be uh, super interesting and I'm quite sort of like recommend looking at them. But um, yeah, handing over to the BDO team to uh, carry on, but thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Really appreciate that. Um, and so, uh, we, if I were to just recap what we looked at right now, right? We 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 started off with what the threat landscape looks like from a BDO standpoint. What is, what do we think are the attack vectors? What are some of the areas of attack from there? We then looked at the digital defense report from Microsoft, showing us how prevalent it is. What I. The, the statement that Alkim showed, which was amazing, while reading this sentence, 7,000 plus attacks have already happened. We then looked at some of the war stories that Vijay and Brad have come across as well. Some amazing, you know, very common scenarios and some unique ones as well. So it's prevalent everywhere. And then Jonathan kindly took us through what the Microsoft stack looks like from that offensive security uh, perspective as well. So we've got we've got the experience and the expertise from BDO. We've got the platform from Microsoft. Marrying those two brings out the services that BDO has to offer around security specifically. So when, my, when I talk about BDO services that are available specifically around cybersecurity, let's say, the approach that we take is called as perpetual defense. It's an ideology, it's an approach that we look at, and it's made up of three umbrella uh, services or solution areas in there. We start with Active Insights, which allows us to look at our infrastructure, show us, report against it, and tell us what's available, for, uh, what, what's there in terms of your secure score, in terms of your secure, uh, security in the first place, and how can we potentially optimize it as well? Are there any missing bits and pieces? We get that sorted out in the Active Insights space. Then comes the Active Protect, which is essentially our MXDR SOC service. It's around monitoring, hunting, investigating, and defending, responding to those threats that we get. How do we make sure we've got that uh, SOC service in there? And then Active Assure is around governance, right? right from data governance all the way to incident response as well. So when I look at our cybersecurity story, it's perpetual defense with these three umbrella solutions in there. And when I zoom in even further, specifically for offensive security, offensive security and DFIR, as we call it, would fall into the second and third bucket in there. Active Protect and Active Assure, the combination of two will give us, a, there are components of offensive security in these two umbrella solutions as well. Certain components are proactive in nature, Certain components are reactive in nature, but we've got various services that would fall into one of these three basic umbrellas or basic buckets 
of our services. So I'm going to bring back, I'm going to invite Brad and uh, Vijay again, just to talk us through what are the offensive security and DFIR services that we have within BDO as well. Thanks, Amit. Thank you. So we at BDO to design this offensive security DFIR for three questions. One, how do I stay out of trouble? That's normally the questions from the client. Hence, we introduce offensive security testing. We understand pen testing and vulnerability assessment can be taken over by Copilot, Gen AI, but there are limitations that Copilot or Gen AI cannot do, such as contextualization or interpreting an in ambiguous output and human and interpersonal stuff, which is part of the offensive security testing. Basically, we make the tool think the way we think and getting the right output, which is in the mindset of being offensive to enhance your defense. That's the first service offering that we do is offensive security testing. Hence, I did not put, is it limited to application? Is it limited to infrastructure, cloud? No, basically anything that can be networked can be hacked. Hence, we offer this as one single solution and it is available in the Azure portal uh, for direct uh, customers to straight away go click button and you get started. And we are ethical. So <laughs> everything goes through a proper authorization letter and we are legally abiding by that. That's one of the limitations of Gen AI that there's no legal or ethical considerations when you leverage it because it does. Live. However, there might be models coming in which will check for it. The second one is more advanced than the offensive security testing. Here, the question that gets answered is, how do I know if I'm not already under a breach? Which is, am I in trouble? That's the question we try to answer. So this works practically for SMCs who either cannot afford to have a bigger SOC, but they still want to make sure they don't have a APT sitting in their environment. This is an XDR in the pocket like a box that goes there, collects everything, analyze you for a couple of weeks. Is there any indicator of compromise? Is there any indicator of attack? And uh, one of the things we introduce here is mean time to exfiltrate. Not mean time to respond, mean time to uh, you know, recover everything. But this one will also tell you if I am sitting inside the office premise, how much time it takes for me to take 10 gigabytes outside. And then how much detection capability do you have? And that covers in the you know compromise assessments. Basically, a very technical uh, agnostic review on your infrastructure and applications that you have. And end of day, what you will find is most of the time, either you had an APT, which was a ticking time bomb sitting there, or you had a complete different perception about how users use your infrastructure with having amazing number of unwanted potentially you know plug built softwares which can instantly introduce malware into the environment so the output will actually discipline and also give you a level of assurance that if i were to be attacked it's going to take a little bit longer time if you were making sure that you action all the recommendations come out of it which is i call it a more advanced offensive security testing but it also includes monitoring and the final part is, how do I get out of trouble? This is a reactive security when the incident happened and then you need an expertise. We work in the fashion of retainer model here and we are on standby for those customers. When they are in an incident, they already have a playbook to engage us and within minutes, we are there as there's an extended security team solving the issues. Basically, uh, Brad always will be wearing a parachute so that he can just <laughs> jump into it and then start shooting out everything that you see malicious. Uh, so basically, it's, we, uh, we also bring the business knowledge and making sure to make right impact and decision making to the stakeholders and in containing and uh, making sure you learn the lessons and apply on top of it. So we have done all these three in a single customer. Yeah. They were engaged for us to do a testing and our guys were able to compromise in 20 minutes. 
and we had that suspicion why is that very old but if the question was it was a reason mergers and acquisitions of a new company which they already allowed as part of a bigger company but then we started going cloud compromise assessment and we found them they're getting 84 times breach every single day we could see the cloud every servers on their infrastructure had a command and control running yeah and which was not part of the testing right and then that you find in cloud compromise assessment eventually it become a digital forensics incident response review that is now what part of the deal that I need to make contingent before the entire m &E mergers and acquisition deal gets completed? How do I reduce the evaluations that is done on that form when, when I acquire or put a loan on that new firm so that you can recover the money that they have spent on us in order to recover? So this is an entire life cycle that we did. And we do have customers independently using all of this. I always get questions on when do I do pen testing? When do I do compromise assessment? And when should I have retainer? It's absolutely depending upon your appetite to perform what you wanted to perform. But I feel personally, all these three should be part of your strategy of completely staying out of trouble proactively. Assuming you will have a bridge, you have a retainer covered. And if you don't have a bridge, use that money to perform the other two services. If not, enhance it more with our active insights with our perpetual concept and uh, yeah that's the three service lines that we currently very dedicatedly focus rather than uh, you know only glorifying stories we have customers really really strong from outside to inside there is no way you can break them from outside to inside even if you compromise their credentials they check you out of the way the moment you log on your ip is blocked the moment you log on from Nigeria, it keeps blocked. Do whatever you want, you get blocked. They're really, really good customers, but we have taken a journey for five years to reach them. Right now, we are now trying the other part, which is inside now. And we want to make sure that inside, you allow the employees to do whatever they want, trust them, but verify every single thing and shoot down everything, kill first, and then discuss what happened. That's the approach we are taking on an internal strategy to make sure that they allow everybody to do whatever they want, but not worry about security. That's the mentality we, 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 we are helping. So majority of the time, it starts with a small engagement, but eventually we become partner. And I personally have uh, customers retained with us from last six years, but we do different variety of tests. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Vijay. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, uh, Jonathan and Alkim from Microsoft as well. And thanks to all the uh, attendees here as well, virtually as well as in person. We've got Vijay and Brad, as we said, who are from the BDO Offensive Security team. And if you have any Microsoft related questions as well, we've got the Microsoft team here. Myself, I'm Yash. We've got Andy, we've got Rich, and we've got Dave as well. So feel free to reach out. Thanks a lot and have a great day.